Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the most important conversation to be had in trucking, the state of capacity. Where are we? When will we see equilibrium again? And maybe even when we might see a tight market. I'm your host, Tom Albrecht of Reliance Partners, and I'm pleased to be joined by three of the best thought leaders on all things trucking, particularly trucking capacity. Uh, on today's webinar, we will be taking questions, so feel free to use the chat capability in the webinar. And as a little bit, bit of background for our, our uh, audience, Reliance is the largest independent insurance agency focused solely on trucking and logistics. We work with over 8,000 motor carriers and about 400 freight brokers. We believe we have some unique insights as well into capacity. But with that said, uh, today's guests are Craig Fuller of Freight Waves, Chris Pickett of uh, Flock Freight, and Tim DeNoyer of ACT Research. Gentlemen, welcome aboard. And uh, I'm going to ask each of you to take a brief moment and tell everyone what your current role is and how long you've been around this crazy industry that we love called trucking. Chris, let's start with you. Sure, you bet, Tom. So Chris Pickett, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Flock Freight, uh, where I've been for the last three years. Uh, Flock's building the first of its kind scale shared truckload platform. Uh, and then in my spare time, uh, I cover the freight markets and put out a, a monthly newsletter uh, titled The Picket Line under, under Picket Research. We're basically looking to directionally predict uh, where spot and contract um, line haul rates are headed. Uh, prior to that, spent 14 years uh, building out Kite Logistics as an early uh, member of that leadership team. Great. Craig, how about you? Yeah, I'm the CEO and founder of Freight Waves. I've uh, been around the industry my whole life, literally, my whole <laughs> life. And uh, we we have two uh, primary businesses. One is a media business, which provides contacts, report on news and breaking stories. And the other is we have a high-frequency data business, which is we track all the fundamental data across the market uh, and uh, uh, make it easy to ingest that information into uh, various uh, automation systems. Craig, is there a picture of you instead of having a pacifier, maybe having a spark plug in your mouth since you've been around the industry so <laughs> I'm long? I'm sure I did. I mean, smelling uh, axle <laughs> grease, uh, fifth fifth wheel grease, is actually a uh, a bit of a fetish for me. Like I, I enjoy the smell <laughs> of a new truck. So uh, when I smell them, it uh, brings back fond memories of my of my childhood. That's great, Tim. Tell us briefly about yourself. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, um, I've been at Act Research for uh, a little over six years. Uh, we specialize in, in commercial vehicle market forecasting, data analysis, and consulting. Uh, you may know me if you read the CAS Freight Index Report uh, or the Act Freight Forecast. Uh, I also spend a lot of time uh, on the upcoming equipment regulations uh, and uh, the used truck market. Uh, so, And similar to you, Tom, uh, my background is in the financial community. <laughs> yes, indeed. In fact, we met in Connecticut uh, when we were both still on Wall Street, probably 15 plus years ago. So uh, good to have all of you on the show today. Craig, I'm going to start the first question uh, aimed at you. So last week on your monthly update, you talked about how this year could have some parallels with 2017. And I don't necessarily want you to regurgitate all of that. Uh, I've got actually a question that goes beyond that. But for our audience, I think some of the things that you may have meant were, uh, the year prior, so 2016, really stunk. Well, we know 2023 stunk. Uh, the year 2017 began with another round of pressure on contact uh, contract freight rates, similar to what we're seeing in the market today. And then around June, there was a sense of, wait a minute, the worst is behind us. So really, here's my question, though. There were also two other things back in 17 that impacted the market. The first was the anticipation of Trump's tax cuts, which didn't get passed till the end of the year, but the animal spirits that were unleashed, unleashed by that with businesses and investors really made for a pretty exciting second half of the year. And of course we had the ELD mandate in December of that year, but the six to nine months leading up to that, the small fleets we're seeing capacity reduced as they adopted ELD. So the question is, we could start like 17, but what's the risk that we have a more of a mediocre second half in, instead of seeing the stage set for a really dynamic 2025, which is what we saw in the second half of 17? Yeah, I mean, look, there's always a risk and there's a lot of risks in this market. I mean, uh, one of the really challenging things to diagnose where we're at is, 
you know, we have entered sort of a, in many ways, a new economy uh, in a post-COVID world where the Federal Reserve regime, which drives so much of economic activity, has changed their stance from sort of zero interest rates or low interest rates to, to now actually charging relatively high, at least compared to where we were over the past decade, a uh, cost of capital. Well, that changes uh, and has changed the way companies allocate capital, the way they think about investments. And so it is certainly, uh, there are a lot of risks uh, uh, in terms of whether we turn bullish or not. But Tom, I think about the fact that um, if you go back to 17, to your point, uh, 2016 was a, a pretty severe or a, a sizable industrial recession, certainly commodities, it was pretty severe. There's a lot of folks in the oil patch that filed bankruptcy that year. Um, and we were coming out of that in 2017. And it was the summer of 17 where the animal spirits, as you talk about, turned around. And then we get hit with a major substantial hurricane season. Remember, Harvey was in 2017. That's what really yeah. kicked off the sort of bull run of 17 to, to really the summer of 18. I think it could happen again this year. You know, we are in a situation where a lot of capacity is burned off. Uh, we have a lot of companies that are, are are being pretty conservative in terms of growing their fleet. They've kept things pretty uh, pretty uh, conservative. We're in an election year, which is sort of a new twist to to that story, where uh, you know the Biden administration has these major and substantial spending bills of government stimulus, uh, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act, the Industrial uh, Infrastructure Act, the Chips Act. We have a lot of money that's still yet to be deployed into our economy. And we could see that accelerated out of fear if it's not deployed fast enough, the Trump administration, if they win the election, could underwrite, could, could reverse those rules. And so I actually think we'll see a lot of government stimulus come in in the second half, combined with the fact that we've we bled off a lot of capacity and we're not yeah. seeing really capacity uh, enter the industry uh, at any level that's going to... Um, that's going to suggest that we're going to have anything but a continuation of lead, of lead off. So that is the reason that I say that the second half is, should be much more like 2017. And if we have a weather event uh, like a hurricane, that could also uh, continue to create uh, construction uh, and capacity bay building. Yeah, and I think that's going to be something we're going to benchmark all year long because I have sharp memories of uh, 2017. Tim, I want to ask you a different question. We had about a two-year boom. And it's hard to be exactly precise, but let, let's say May and June of 2020, states were reopening post the COVID shutdown. And generally, the second half of that year was busy. 2021 was the greatest trucking year anyone ever saw. And then as we got into 2022, smaller fleets and the spot market began to have issues in the first quarter. But larger fleets were kind of after Labor Day. Um you know, the enterprise motor carriers, et cetera. So if we kind of blend Q1 post Labor Day, then it's about the middle of 2022 where the freight boom kind of ended. So is it as simple as we had a two-year boom? So as we get into the middle part of this year, it's been about a two-year correction, or is that oversimplifying the issue? <laughs> well, I mean, that's certainly true. Um, <laughs> is it oversimplifying it? I mean, the cycle is pretty complicated, so maybe. Uh, but uh, it was certainly one of the best cycles, you know, uh, or the best cycle ever by far. And, and uh, you know, maybe Isaac Newton's third law, uh, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction uh, is, is at play to some extent. Um, we've already been through a longer freight downturn um, than any of the past several. Um, and so... I think that's just one thing from a, a historical perspective to keep in mind. That's that, that certainly a uh, um, constructive. Um, certainly agree with with Craig's points of, of, about you know capacity washing out in a, in a pretty big way, uh, which does suggest that 24 and 25 are back to um, more of a positive part of the cycle. Uh, but how positive is is clearly the the biggest question. Um, one of the key things that we look at a lot, of course, is uh, what's happening with Class Eight tractors uh, and, and the new ones that are hitting the road. And, and those sales have come down a good bit uh, over the past several months, uh, but they're still a little bit above replacement. So we're still adding to the fleet overall. And that, those capacity additions that are still happening are mainly private fleets. I mean, we obviously know for higher capacity is contracting considerably at the moment, uh, but we do also know that these new truck sales are you know pretty strong. So somebody's buying them. Now that's changing this year versus last year. And this is a big part of the supply dynamic changing is we're going from adding about 50,000 new tractors to the fleet in the US uh, last year to probably taking a few thousand out this year. Not 
a ton, but some, and that's a pretty big change in the supply dynamic. And uh, that's not alone going to change the freight cycle, but I think that is uh, certainly you know very notable. And and along with a pretty strong economy, um, you know I, I think um, that that should drive the freight growth that that does get the the market back at least towards equilibrium pretty soon uh, in a few months, but and then you know, not necessarily tight for a while though. So Tim, what is replacement either on an annual number or monthly? You know, what what do you think that is from a tractor perspective? I mean, rough numbers, we need about 150,000 new uh, Class 8 tractors uh, to be sold in this country each year just to sort of maintain the fleet size, uh, just based on normal mileage and how these engines uh, age over time. Okay. Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot for a, probably a little bit of a difficult question to be precise on, but I want you to give it your best. Uh, at the depth of this freight recession, what's your best estimate as to how much excess capacity we may have had percentage wise? Give us your best thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I tend to look at these markets on a year-over-year -year rate basis. So it's all relative supply versus relative demand you know, in terms of of a number around, you know, seated tractor counts. I think, you know, from where, you know, Tim sits, he's probably in a better position to, to answer that. But I look at it relative to rates. And I think what is... Was maybe underappreciated is just how durable and consistent these pricing cycles, spot versus contract, tend to be on a year over year basis. I mean, sequentially, quarter over quarter, it's an EKG chart, it's all over the place. Certainly, it biases inflationary, but there's a lot of ups and downs along the way. But if you look at the data on a year over year basis and kind of plot what those uh, line haul tractor rates are doing, it's pretty darn consistent. And it's been pretty darn consistent, at least since I started paying attention back in, in 2006. And so, kind of what I believe drives fundamentally. Right, the the rate of overshoot and collapse is probably the hardest thing to measure, which is the rate of supply exit. And so, regardless of the reason, you know, when we're in an up cycle, like we were in 2021, 2000, you know, early part of 22, just like we were in 2017, the the market will seek to expand. Supply comes in, and then as we often do, as you know, profit seeking human beings, we overshoot in a very fragmented marketplace, and suddenly those trucks show up, and there's not enough demand to to utilize them, and then you get the washout. So the washout's been really happening in earnest since Q2 of 2022 in this particular cycle. You know, as Tim noted, it's probably been the most severe washout on record, but it's also coming off of the most severe uh, overshoot, you know, on record as well. And so there's definitely some proportionality around what goes up must come down at a similar level of kind of amplitude and duration. So that's what we're seeing now. And you know, the way that we look at the data picket research showed, you know, we hit bottom, you know, really in Q1 of 2023 on a year over year basis. You know, sequentially, it's been bopping around since then. But on a year-over-year -year basis, we bottomed out at, you know, negative 32%. Um, that compares to about a minus 19% in the 2019 kind of downdraft. But also is compared to a plus 56% peak in 2021 mm -hmm. versus a 31% peak in, in 2018. And so I guess if you answer you how much excess supply was there in the market at the bottom, I would just answer with enough to cause a 31% you know, negative kind of year-over-year -year relative change in spot rates. And that supply has been burning off, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, the rate of which is super hard to, to, to look at. You can look at, uh, you know, the operating authorities, uh, you know, granted versus, uh, you know, taken back. You can look at class A, you know, tractor orders that uh, ACT kind of puts out. We look at that. Sonar's got great data. So that supply has been exiting. The question is, uh, it, maybe it's not exiting fast enough to, to, to make a turn in the market. I would say kind of right now, Q1 quarter to date, and again, my answer to this question was maybe different if you'd asked me four weeks ago. I yeah, think coming you know, into the first quarter into January, the market was about at equilibrium. You know, spot line haul rates were about minus 1% year over year. With February baked in, we're back to kind of minus, you know, three and a half, right? 4%. You know, it's kind of one, you know, two steps forward, kind of one step back. And so from a, a technical definition of, you know, line haul rates being flat year over year, we're close-ish to equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Um is when do we break through and then what happens after that? You know, my observation is kind of once you break through, whether that's uh, this quarter or certainly by next quarter, you know, it tends to be a pretty steady climb higher on a year-over-year -year basis. And so, you know, assuming we kind of break through this quarter, next quarter, I mean, I still believe spot line haul rates are at least 30% higher by the end of the year. Wow. I agree, I agree with Chris. I think Chris is right. I mean, it, we, we look at a slightly different variable. Uh, we look at the spot, the contract spread, which 
is one is basically what shippers are charged on contract and one is what you buy the truck for. Think of that as the brokerage margin. Yep. And if you take the fuel surcharge out of it, and one could argue typically you have a, at least a dollar twenty fuel surcharge in it, but I like to make it as a pure play, is at its depth, it was a dollar a mile cheaper from the spot market. It was a dot there was a spread between a dot the contract market and the spot market by a dollar a mile. That is converged to more in January, it's it started to come into tandem. And it looks like it, I think that's what shows that the market's turning around, uh, going back to more of a traditional cycle, is when that spread comes back into sort of more normalized range, which is where we will be uh, if if we see continued contraction in uh, uh, the contract market with at least spot uh, a holding firm. I think it's a super yeah. cool point. I think it is that juxtaposition of spot versus contract on the market. And why I would argue kind of right now is probably the most dangerous time, whether you're on procurement or if you're you know managing you know contract you know volume for for large asset or non asset based broker carrier because while spots made the turn right contract lags so those contract rates are still resetting down which is probably yeah. why this moment in time feels just so lousy you know we're in Feb you know the spot market you know took a step backwards uh, you know we're in early to, to to mid stages of a lot of bids and all those bid rates are going down right anyone who's on the market now are seeing contract rates go down you know not up and so you're going to come into this tension where you're going to see that spread kind of narrow. I guess my experience the last you know four or five of these is you know once it kind of breaks you get this reinforcing kind of you know compounding effect where all of a sudden the game is you know how much of this contract freight can I say no to yeah, and reject and not torch my relationship with a shipper and then we get in this phase of uh, you know run on mini bids and you know those contracts reset but that probably doesn't happen really in earnest until you know early Q3 and and, and Tom did that sort of back to my point about the summer and the fall I mean. Yep. There is a calendar element mm -hmm. that you play into this factor is that, you know, we see beverage season hit, we see proto season hit, and then we go into sort of preparing for peak season. The market at that point, in, at least where, as, as far as where I sit, will have largely reset, um, assuming the consumer stays strong and the economy stays strong. We should see a much more robust second half. Tim, your or ACT has partnered with one of the two big load boards. What's your assessment when you look at the spot market and some of the other data points that both Chris and Craig have talked about? Is it similar or do you have a different perspective? Well, in the short term, I, I, I certainly agree. I mean, um, I'll certainly give a shout out to our friends at DAT. Um, <laughs> um, the, um, the, I think their data is excellent. It, it is certainly soft right now. Uh, the big question that we're asking, um, and I, I'm interested in, in hearing sort of all the, the views on this panel, to, not to answer your question with a question, but uh, uh, is this sort of newish phenomenon of using rate APIs? And it seems like more and more freight is being moved using this sort of um, maybe call it a third party that's sort of in between spot and contract. Um, both brokers and fleets, the, the smart ones that I've talked to are, are on it. Um, and and um, it seems like more and more freight is sort of moving in this, I call it a gray area. Uh, but uh, I think that maybe will make uh, the spot market a little bit more sensitive as this year progresses. Uh, and while I think it's going to take time for us to get to equilibrium, once we you know sort of hit that and things turn positive, uh, I, I think... Um, there is some risk that uh, that you, you you know you'll see a you'll need a lower load to truck ratio to move rates up. Let me put it that way. Okay, that Chris, sense. I saw you nodding your head. Can you expound on that? The whole rate API uh, connection, et cetera. Yeah, and there's definitely been a a wave of of spot pricing via APIs. And in the early days when this came out, it was really only the larger kind of scale of brokers really had the tech to be able to plug in. But I think through the last you know two years, the the playing field has leveled in, in a big big way, and so you've got off shelf tech where it's you know relatively easy to to plug in, even for you know mid sized to to small brokers, and so and it creates this almost this arms race where these kind of bid boards and everyone's you know scraping the bid boards and you know quoting you know you know two cents minus you know best bid and, and driving kind of rates down. In terms of where the end game of that is and whether that's a healthy thing or not, I think remains to be seen. Um, but that's really dynamic that, you know, that's out in the marketplace right now. We've got a question from Melissa, and it ties into what we're talking about right now. I'm going to read this. I have noticed in the past few weeks rates going up to a manageable rate per mile. I assume she means spot. Is that expected to continue throughout the year? Chris, you already alluded to the fact that you expect spot rates, I guess, from the low point this year to be up 30% by year end. 
Um, anybody else want to add to uh, Melissa's question? Sure. I think she's also talking about it from a carrier perspective because that, that being manageable yeah. would suggest it's up. I mean, look, I'm just looking at where we sort of peaked. We peaked in late January. Uh, this is stripping out fuel surcharge in spot at $1.85 a mile. And that has since dropped to $1.60. So we're down 25 cents uh, from where we sort of peaked in late January. Um, it's a, you know, that is a, it's a pretty sizable drop. Uh, it was sort of unexpected. It's before we took the recording or having this call, Tom, we had a small conversation among ourselves is that Fred has been pretty abysmal um, as a, as a general rule. I talked to a lot of CEOs that are uh, connected to the spot market and have large portfolios that talked about how just bad things have been in, in the month of February. That is a seasonal factor. February is always abysmal. We always seem to forget it. Um, but I think this year it feels a lot worse because in January we were coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I well, do think we will continue to see uh, higher spot rates. This is probably the low of the year, if I had to guess. Well, and I, I noticed this first around 2003, 2004. It used to be coming off Christmas that January was always the worst freight month in the calendar year. And February was a little bit better. But around 18, 20 years ago, January became semi-respectable, really for two reasons. One was the gift card phenomena. 70% mm -hmm. of them are spent within about 40 days. And then the other was, as we became so import heavy and the Chinese New Year had to be planned around, always in February, more was ordered in January. And that lifted that fortunes of that month. And then February is the real stinker anymore. So to your point, I don't know that we read too much into the first 60 days of the year. It certainly is still supported by a lot of the thoughts that we've been sharing. Let me, uh, Tim, let me ask you a question. So you and I had dinner a couple of weeks ago. I, I believe that um, you're kind of positive on retail sales. Inflation adjusted retail sales were negative much of 2023, but you're of the belief that we're going to actually see real increases in retail sales pretty soon now. Can you elaborate on why you're optimistic? Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, and and I think uh, we've gone through a, a you know pretty considerable downturn these last couple of years, just in the goods economy broadly. And 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 I think we're there are some very good signs that we're we're finally coming out of it. Now, some of it is sort of. Uh, reverberations from the pandemic still. Uh, and so some of that's just, uh, we've got some tailwind this year for goods demand, uh, just because we're, we're going through that lack of headwind. And the same thing from, from an inventory perspective, where we've been through an 18 month destock, and we don't even need to really restock, we just need the absence of that destock to bring in more freight. And that's why we're seeing imports on the West Coast up 20% year over year. Uh, those aren't actually huge volumes, <laughs> but those are strong increases. And, um, <clears throat> And so we're starting to see those kinds of things uh, turn in the cycle. I mean, I think one of the main drivers and, and um, certainly the inflation picture is something we're going to be watching very, very closely. Uh, but real incomes you know, after inflation uh, grew 4.2 percent last year. Uh, productivity in the economy was really good, uh, especially these last couple of quarters. Uh, and so um, we're actually pretty optimistic about uh, the U.S. economy overall. I mean, interest rates are certainly a headwind, but uh, um, but I don't think, you know, just the, the broad strength uh, of both, you know, just overall net worth in the economy, but uh, but the industrial cycle didn't really turn down very much. And, and we're, we're seeing, you know, as our other guests mentioned, you know, some some good, a lot of project growth out there uh, in, in infrastructure and nearshoring and those kinds of things are, are very important themes right now. Um, but uh you know, to come back to the near term a little bit, I, I do think, you know, as we said, rates are going to uh, fall off a little bit uh, in the short term after that. I, I think a lot of what, what happened in January was was a bit of a weatherhead fake. And, and I think that's um, that's fading. Uh, but I do think that uh, by the time we get to Q2, as seasonality picks up, um, one of the reasons things are bad right now is is just as, as you mentioned, Chinese New Year is um, <clears throat> was just going on recently uh and and so it's going to be soft for a little while it was a few weeks later than than last year this year so those comps may be a little bit tough through march but um but by the time we get to april may i do think you know things are going to be picking up in a in a considerable way from a, from a demand standpoint um i think the us economy you know is surprisingly good if you look at the blue chip chip economic indicators i think G, the consensus gdp is about two and a half percent this year and some of the smartest 
forecasters are moving up closer to 3%. So it, it's pretty, um, it, it's fascinating. We've got an intermodal question here. Chris, I'm going to aim it at you initially. And um, Craig, you may want to jump in. We have seen both good commentary and good data from the intermodal community over the last several weeks, um, particularly out West. My question is, is that really uh, an indication that the intermodal market is strong when what we've got going on uh, with the Red Sea attacks, the drought in the Panama Canal, um, we've got labor peace out West, we've got labor uncertainties in the East. Is that really a read, their strength, that the intermodal market is strong, or is that just particular to the West Coast? Yeah, I'll take a stat. Um, again, I'm not close enough to it relative to the truckload markets to maybe have a, a too terribly kind of informed opinion. But yeah, generally speaking, you know, when there is you know strength in truckload, you see a lot of kind of relative strength, you know, truly not intermodal. I don't think that that's happening yet. It's like truck rates have gotten so high where you're seeing that failover into uh, either intermodal or, or anything's fundamentally you know spiked yet with you know, with diesel. Definitely have to bid some some consumption patterns or some kind of you know, volume flow patterns relative to all the things you mentioned, and kind of we saw that with an especially strong you know last couple of months of uh, West Coast import data. So I'm sure that's part of the, of the relative surge. But I think whether it's for real or not, I guess I would have towards it feels a little more real to me, maybe you know, versus attributing it just to kind of one offs. But I'd be curious to see if uh, Craig's got other perspectives on this. Well, yeah, and I mean, Craig, before yeah. you comment. Yeah. We know that the West Coast ports are more naturally an intermodal type of product versus the yep. East Coast. So with that as the backdrop, let's see you take that question and run a little bit further. Yeah, but I mean, don't forget the I-35 corridor. I mean, that Mexico trade is also a big intermodal. That's why yep. Kansas City Southern was such a uh, bell of the ball, because everyone right. realized that there was a lot of opportunity on the North-South trade. I think what we're seeing is, I mean, intermodal does really well because it's a it's a fungible commodity between truckload. It competes, but it does really well when service is not as intense. And I think what we're seeing is that we have normalized the supply chain, like regardless of there have always been disruptions. Yes, we haven't had container ships being attacked by some, you know, by military grade technology, but we've always had some level of weather disruptions that happen. So disruptions are not unusual. But what happens is the market has a certain way that it operates. And intermodal tends to provide uh, a lower cost uh, product when there is availability of chassis, which we have now in, in plenty of availability. And you have a lot of import activity as you see intermodal do really well. And imports are actually pretty robust relative to where they were last year. So we look at all those factors and the fact that it's a cheaper form of transportation than an then truckload and service requirements aren't as intensive, uh, that all favors the intermodal market. Now, intermodal has a, there's a finite ceiling for intermodal, as we all know. At some point, uh, it, it, it can't provide more capacity than it right. physically can. It will run out. And when that happens, that will be a really strong, uh, I think, a bullish indicator for the over-the-road trucking business on these long-haul uh, runs. You know, one of my old canary in the coal mine indications for when a market was either getting better or beginning to weaken was TOFC or trailer on flat car piggyback, so to speak, uh, intermodal numbers, even though it's only six or seven percent of the intermodal volumes on a typical year. It used to be when the market was getting tight, that number would go up 20, 30 percent. Crazy. Even though the whole market's gone towards containers, same thing, it would fall off a cliff. But we didn't see that same dynamic because the whole intermodal system had this big meltdown in 2021. So maybe we can get back to that being a, a normalized indicator as we go forward here. Um, but I wanted to kind of just also del d dive in a little bit different here. So, you know, when we think about capacity, is it fair to say, Craig, that the worst was dry van, second worst was reefer, and then flatbed. We do have a question in the audience there. It had its own slump as well, but it didn't ever seem quite as severe as those first two sectors. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there's a reason for that is that flatbed, you know, if you think about it, a flatbed is not interchangeable between refrigerated and van. So yep. it didn't have the sort of robustness of the market. And it's easier, the barriers to entry to move into flatbed are, are quite different than they are into the van market. There's a lot of the digitization, whether it's the apps or the load boards, historically have favored 
the van market. And so when you have a lot of new entrants into the market, that's the market that they enter is the van market because it's very easy for them to start a business. There aren't a lot of barriers to entry in that. Um, and so largely that's where we saw the capacity expansion was in the van market. And because of the interchangeability between re reefer and van, not van to reefer, but reefer to van, it means that that's all, all, always going to be the market that's going to be oversupplied because that reefer capacity is is fungible between ever, whichever market. Uh, yep. Now, the reefer market, the van market can't go upstream, but the reefer market can go downstream into the van market. So it is exactly what you described. And that has a lot to do with just the structural uh, elements that drive these markets. Uh, flatbed is just harder to get. It just, it's a smaller market and tends to to have a bit more sort of barriers to entry, just the way it works. Uh, and reefer in itself has a bigger capex that you have to have. It doesn't have sort of, it, it. there's not as many refrigerated trailers being built. Tim can expand on this. Uh, and then van, anyone can take a reefer and put it in the van market. You can't do the other way around. Well, when I was an analyst on Wall Street, the publicly traded uh, reefer carriers or those that had large reefer divisions, they would always disclose that about 20% of their loads in those reefer trailers were when they turned the reefer unit off and, and hauled dry. And I can imagine for a smaller carrier, it'd be an even higher percentage, except during times like produce season or what yeah, have you. I I think higher interest rates probably also change the equation on whether they buy the reefer unit or or not. Fuel we know has an impact on that. Um, so those are all things that factor. Also, an intermodal one thing we should talk about is a fuel surcharge. That's that's actually a bullish fuel surcharge on intermodal is, is less than it is on a van. So you tend to see when you have high fuel prices, you tend to see uh, intermodal become even more economical than that. And the same thing in refrigerated. I mean, it costs money to fuel those uh, reefer units. It sure does. Tim, I've got a question for you. Earlier, you mentioned that last year, uh, about 50,000 tractors entered the market as net capacity growth. And um, a lot of times, larger carriers will say, well, we're not adding at all. And yet, the delivery numbers suggest that there are capacity additions. And uh, I think your number is interesting because even if large carriers aren't planning to add, um, their used tractors become such a source of capacity growth. And we've seen that at Reliance. So that's another reason why you're bullish. You're seeing deliveries that will just about mirror replacement only this, this year, I believe. Can you expound on that just a little bit more? Yeah, it's a great question. Maybe um, I'll come back to it. I want to add one point to the intermodal discussion. Um, on our calculation, um, intermodal spot rates are about 5% uh, at a tighter discount right now to truckload than they usually are at this time of year. So that does tell you that that, that there's some um, tailwind already starting to help spot rates uh, coming from those Western West Coast imports. So I think that that's interesting to just throw in. Uh, but um, in terms of the uh, the equipment, yeah, used truck prices have come way down. Uh, to be honest, I think that uh, to some extent could be a factor keeping some of those marginal operators in the market, uh, especially. You know, we had a, a dealer CEO speak at our seminar last week who, who made a point that, you know, he helps finance some of these vehicles and he does not want, uh, you know, his customers to be, you know, going out of the market. So he's going to go out of his way to, to you know, help them through. Uh, and I think a lot of dealers kind of feel that way uh, with with used truck prices where they are at the moment. We're kind of below what is a normal sort of residual value already. And, and so people, you know, want to get through this to the extent that they can. And, and there's, there's a lot of that out there. Of course, there's, there's a lot who, who just can't. So uh, that that's certainly um, taking its toll. Uh, I do think one of the interesting, you know, you know, there's been a lot of resilience because of how much money everybody made in, in the great markets of, you know, 20 through early 22. Uh, but uh, but I think um, that is is running pretty, uh, pretty dry. Uh, and it's worth kind of, you know, talking about, we talked about the the, the spread between spot rates uh, and contract rates, which of course is critical. But when you think about that in terms of the total class eight tractor market, we think roughly half the market is in private fleets. And those private fleet costs per mile are you know, maybe a dollar per mile there above <laughs> because just less efficient operations, higher driver pay, those kinds of things. Uh, and so 
you know, there was a lot of focus on supply chain resiliency and, and a lot of that um, was you know, a big surprise last year, just how strong uh, new equipment demand was. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it did slow through the year, I think later than most of us expected, uh, and, and it is still coming down. So, um, I'd say class A tractor sales normalizing is, is a really key, key factor this year. Yeah. Chris, let me throw out five buckets of freight, um, and uh, your quick take, and then I want to get everybody else's as well on whether it's going to be a good year or a mediocre year for these and retail automotive cross-border, housing, and industrial. So retail, auto, industrial, housing, and cross-border. What, what, which one or two do you think will be the best this year? I think they've all got opportunity to, to outperform, you know, to, to be honest. Um, cross-border's up there for sure. Um, and I think housing. I mean, there's just... Yep. They, reality is there's not enough housing out there. I think industrial is a bit of a wild card where, you know, if you look at the CapEx and, and manufacturing capacity, you know, so much of that's dialed in to support, you know, chips at construction and semiconductors and, and high cost facilities that you know, typically aren't as, you know, drive in, you know, truckload, right? Freight intensive. So it's hard to read too much into, into the CapEx piece, but yeah, I do look at, you know, things like, you know, consumption and some of the four leading indicators that, that Tim had mentioned where historically, uh, you know, consumption is going to be the driver, ideally durable, non-durable goods consumption. And those have been trending up and to the right. They've been accelerating the last four quarters. Uh, service has been flat. Industrial production tends to, to follow consumption and then freight demand, as you'd expect, you know, the more stuff we need to manufacture to meet domestic consumption, the more freight capacity is needed to, to move that stuff. And all of that is pointing up and to the right right now, and especially durable and non-durable goods consumption, uh, with the exception of, of industrial production. So IP kind of collapsed to basically flatline the last you know, two, three or four quarters. And it's been there despite the, the tug in, in consumption. Um, so I think just looking at, at those historical relationships, either consumption is wrong and it, there's a head fake there and goods consumption is not as strong as the macro data would suggest that's going to turn over to, to meet IP. I don't think that's the case. Or eventually IP, as more of that destocking happens, is going to have to pick back up. And with it, the incremental uh, demand for freight transportation. So I think because of that, I think there will be a positive year in industrial activity, but you know maybe not as much with you know some of the other trends that you know, look to be driving um, you know, large increases in what's going to happen with the housing market most likely and, and cross border transportation. Craig, let me uh, before I get you to comment. I was looking at some of the railroad numbers on metals and chemicals, and over the last couple of months or maybe few months. They've had a lot of weeks of double digit increases year over year. Pretty interesting. Um, with that as a backdrop, and you know, Chris alluded to the fact that IP had a very at best ho hum year last year. What's your outlook for some of those buckets, starting with industrial? I'm I'm more bullish than industrial. I, and I think a lot of it's the American, this is the American decade. I think we, you know, if you sort of follow the America story, we all thought we were losing out to China in the mid 2010s. And 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 clearly that's not the case. I mean, we're seeing European manufacturers move to the United States. We're seeing the largest amount of government uh, industrial spending since the Cold War, and even on a on a uh, even greater amount of money towards the industrial sector, infrastructure sector. So I'm bullish. I sat in a presentation that the CEO of Volkswagen gave to folks in Chattanooga uh, to CEOs, and he said that for per auto manufacturer, not in total. But per auto manufacturer, there's $8 billion of incentives per year through this uh, Inflation Reduction Act that is available to them to, to really retool their whole manufacturing here. And he's like, whether you like it or not, you're going to own an electric vehicle. It's coming <laughs> because you're not going to have a choice because this is what we're building because the government is doing that. And I think, you know, military is now back in vogue. Military spending is back in vogue. Commodities is you know, we are now realizing that we need positive uh, commodity policy. Even the Biden administration, which was attacked the fossil fuel industry for the first two and a half years in office, has largely backed off. They quietly have backed off those messages, realizing that keeping inflation uh, intact is important. I think all those things are super positive. So I'm a, I am real. I would say I'm bullish on the industrial renaissance of the Americas. Um, I agree. Housing, obviously, that's tied to interest rates. 
a retail that's tied to consumer. I still think that's going to be pretty bullish. Cross border, we've talked about it. So the Americas play. I will say though, I am I've, I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting myself. I'm more cautious on auto because I think they have incentives to build a lot of cars that are electric that consumers may not want. Uh, they're <laughs> sitting with a lot of these EVs on lots that can't move them fast enough. Uh, so they may have to sort of wake up to some of those realities. They may have overexpanded uh, in certain areas relative to current consumer demand. Uh, so I would say of those sectors, auto gives me the most concern or pause, but I'm bullish on industrial. So I'll, ta I'll take industrial. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, Doc, can I have the, the cross-border discussion a little bit? Yeah, please do. I, I uh, interviewed a uh, truckload CEO with a big uh, cross-border Mexican business just last week, uh, and uh, all sorts of activity going on south of the border. Uh, you know, north of the border in Canada is kind of status quo generally, but uh, but cross-border um, Mexico is the activity is is insane. I'm sure you've heard about the warehousing going, you know, all that going up around the border. Uh, he talked about uh, uh, consumer goods, you know, toys, uh, machinery, uh, aerospace and defense, uh, the, all that kind of stuff is moving into Mexico right now. There's lots of good end markets. Um, and, and so I think I think that cross border one is you know, it actually has been um, we finished last year a little bit on the soft side, but um, but I think it's it's set to, to recover. Um, and uh, um, I will second the, you know, the industrial um, strength. There's just so much project activity. Uh, another one of the truckload carriers I talked to last week was uh, was a specialized chemical shipper who did talk about some you know green shoots, so to speak, in just the last few weeks of, of demand. Uh, and and that's you know, I, I always look at metals and chemicals as well in terms of great leading inputs of production. So that's a good sign for the next few months of, of industrial activity. Tim, you're close to the auto sector. What are your thoughts on auto? Is it going to have structural issues this year? Um, well, certainly we think you know, from a commercial vehicle perspective, uh, production is going to be relatively resilient. Uh, you know, uh, in, <laughs> we could we could have a whole nother webinar to talk about commercial vehicle electrification. Uh, that's not something we could cover in just a minute. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we're obviously having the same kinds of uh, where are we supposed to do this kind of questions? <laughs> um, and um, <clears throat> they are finding some some good places, but uh uh, it's uh, it's an interesting story there. From a from a light vehicle perspective, you know, I think we've um, generally been positively surprised, uh, and it is a relatively old fleet. And I don't know. I, don't, I think just because the the domestic OEMs aren't very good at building, building EVs yet doesn't really tell us that that auto sales are going to fall apart. They still have plenty of capacity to build, you know, older types of vehicles. I think they're going to fall back on sort of plug-in hybrids in general for the next few years is what it seems like we're kind of heading towards, which is like, a, a, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a light vehicle expert anymore these days, but uh, um, I would suggest that there's there's enough demand for those types of vehicles that um, things should be all right. Uh, but uh, because we've had so many years of, of relatively soft auto sales, um, I, don't, I don't think you know we're coming off a crazy level. So um, yeah, that, that's where I'll leave that one. But I mean, I think that kind of cross-border plus industrial play that has compounding benefits for for the truckload sector. I mean, if that was production, it would have otherwise if you said offshore, you know, coming on container, you know, mm -hmm. on, on the rails and maybe last mile, you know, with the Draymond, if those products are now being at the very least assembled, if not actually manufactured right south of the border, then you know, the, the consumption of actual truckload capacity on a relative basis is going to be that much stronger. Yeah, definitely. Chris, I would, I would. Class A demand is extremely strong in Mexico right now too. We're we're, we're at we're gonna what's been historically like a fifteen thousand unit per year market is gonna be like twenty five this year. So, yeah. But I think in terms of I guess that I guess the trend, I guess how much of the the industrial migration you know south of the border is just you know fundamental economics, you know risk management resiliency versus uh, duty dodging, and and to, and to what extent you know that persists you know post election depending on on who's in the chair and and whether that. Uh, accelerates or decelerates that trend. We certainly have heard that some of the people go moving capacity to Mexico are Chinese suppliers. Are you saying that that wave of uh, inbound imports, you know, used to be China to the U.S. Now it's China to Mexico, and yeah, just sort of from there. There's been a real diversification of imports over the past several years too. So yeah, that's a great point. What about though? I mean, one of the big challenges with cross border is the imbalance. You've got a lot less southbound and a ginormous amount of northbound from Mexico back into the U.S. Uh, it was tough when I was at Celadon, and I think those ratios have gotten even more challenging. Can carriers make money in that market? Yeah. California's entered the chat, Tom. Like, <laughs> talk about a one-way outbound market. Uh, yep. 
I mean, I, I think it's probably more balanced relative to California is when you have those peak imports. Um, so look, carriers have figured out how the market will figure it out. Um, there are issues. I mean, one of the good things is Texas has a very robust economy, both in consumption and consumer goods, huge uh, distribution centers uh, that are located throughout Texas. Of course, it is a huge state. So let's put that in relative. I think it's what, 450 miles from Dallas to Laredo or something. Yep. So that is a sizable deadhead. But you've got Houston, which has uh, got a huge manufacturing and consumption center. So I think um, I think the industry's always had uh, lack of balance problems. It will price those accordingly and deal with them. Um, I think policy is going to be a big concern here because of uh, – with the change of administration, are they going to be positive to sort of the North America play versus um, it, we'll see how that plays out. I think both parties probably prefer Mexico uh, over China as a, as a trading partner, if I were to sort of guess. Let me uh, remind our audience that uh, we are welcoming questions through the chat box. So feel free. We've had a number of questions and I think we've addressed uh, all, but one of them in the natural flow of the conversation Chris, I want to go back to something you said earlier, where I asked you how much excess capacity at the worst point, and then you, I think I heard you say maybe three and a half to 4% might be where we are right now. My question is, can the industry burn off as much as 1% of capacity per month? And and if that happens, that would suggest we'd be around equilibrium by you know mid-year. Is 1% too high to expect to be burnt off? I don't think so, but it's also relative, right? So it's relative capacity relative to the demand, right, for that capacity. Yep. And so I think even with that, even you know, at a you know, base, if GP continues to kind of run at, say, 3%, you know, plus or minus, you know, 50 basis points, I still think that 30%, you know, spot rate rises is a realistic expectation for, you know, for end of the year. Um, I think if some of these... Uh, green shoots, you know, kind of play out in terms of, uh, you know, government stimulus and all the kind of great things around all these sectors, specifically kind of industrial and cross board and other things um, actually act as a secondary tailwind. I think that's where you start getting into that kind of rarefied era of, you know, we could easily see, you know, 40, 50 percent if you get that secondary, you know, kind of push by, you know, by mid-year. But in terms of your question, you know, expecting, you know, whether you're getting from, say, a minus three and a half percent to the equilibrium level, you know, the next three months, I think, you know, Historical patterns would suggest that's entirely doable, and we'll we'll see burnout of capacity well past the inflection point because yeah, yeah. balance yeah. sheets are historical, right? Like Tom, you know that as well yep. as anybody is that the the deficit, the operating deficits of these businesses are going to continue to be a factor in how well they operate. And frankly, if the lenders get more confidence that the market's turning around, they may put more pressure on these guys, which we may not have seen. So I think we'll see a contingency burnout. One thing I would say, and this is entirely anecdotal. Uh, is back in 2019, we were reporting on regular sizable bankruptcies, as many as you know, 10 a week. Well, we've done that at Freight Waves a couple of weeks, and we've reported certainly on some sizable ones. We have we're not seeing the level of of consistency of the bigger uh, companies file bankruptcy versus what we saw in 19. So I think we're still we have not seen the great washout yet. Uh, I think we'll see an acceleration of that, uh, but I don't think we're there yet. We've got a couple more questions coming in, but I want to get to this one in particular. And just for our audience's perspective, near the end, I'm going to put everybody on the spot as for which month the switch flips, so to speak, just to have some fun. Um, Craig, though, Freight Waves has done a really great job, Sonar in particular, of bringing visibility to the uh, outbound tender rejection index. I remember looking at that in 17 when I was at Celadon and you know, preaching to our team, we needed to look at that. And when I used to work in the stock market all those years, we had a term called a dead cat bounce, which was an out of favor stock that would have a temporary rally. Well, so let's shift that dead cat bounce analogy to the tender rejection. So let's say that, I know it's a little over 4% now, but let's say it goes from 4% to 8%, which it's a doubling, but it's nowhere near where we were in 21. Would that be a dead cap bounce? Or at what level would you say it's truly a healthy 
number that's going to start to work for the carriers. I mean, eight percent would be would be relatively strong. That would be a good market. And the reason I say that is, while that is compared to you know thirty percent where we were in two thousand twenty one. Yep. Or 18%, we started measuring it in 2017 and 18. Um, when you talk about the fact that last May, which we would say it was the low of the market, we were at 2.25%. You're talking about a completely different market. Even if uh, today's number is 4.22% of all uh, rejections, that's about, you know, that's less than half or almost uh, twice as much as where we were in May of last year. Not exactly, probably about 70% increase. It's it is much higher. So like I look at it not Tom as the actual number. People say, what's the number I should care about? I care more about the direction of that index than I do the actual number. Take a technical analysis yep. uh, perspective versus a dead counts is I want to see continuation of momentum in the chart, not an actual number. To me, the actual number is less important than the direction directional movement of that index. So um, what I'd like to see is I'll see a, a continued compression and higher rejection rates, because that means carriers are gaining optionality and they're gaining pricing power and they're gaining more power over the shippers and brokers in the market. So that's what I would look for. Chris, when you talked about your spot market outlook, um, what kind of pushback did you get, let's say five or six months ago? Because I think I first heard you articulate online, you were expecting a pretty good spot year this year. And how does that pushback compare to right now? I think it may push it forward by a quarter. I think initially, yeah, six months ago, eight months ago, I think I'd expect that we'd, we'd be closing you know, Q1 year-over-year -year inflationary. Um, I don't think we get there. Um, I think it's I think it's just one more quarter. So I still think we end up at the same place. I think even last year, I was saying you know, plus 30 to 40% on a year-over-year -year basis by the end of, uh, end of 2024. I think that's still where we end up. It's just been like everything else about the cycle, uh, you know, quarter, longer and you know five percentage points worse than yeah you know, what you thought it was going to be is chris the most bullish guy on this call i have to, I, I think so right <laughs> <laughs> so if it turns out we have a banner second quarter is that uh is that what you're saying chris i, 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 yeah. I do think we'll land yeah i think we land year year inflationary by by q2 so about how you perceive it though and how long we're there in terms of, of a flipping you know, my experience is yeah we need at least a couple of months above the rim with that positive trajectory that craig mentioned I think before a lot of those carers get confident enough to start rejecting tenders until the shippers start feeling it, which drives uh, the, the reef, uh, the re uh, contracting and the mini bids and everything that comes after. Again, I think the, the assertion is, you know, so long as the market remains structured the way that it is, primarily in terms of fragmentation and the bearish entry, I see no reason why this dynamic shouldn't continue where, hey, when market rates are, are attractive, it's time to to get in. And, you know, when market rates aren't, then, you know, there's a reckoning and, and we're in the reckoning. And so unless the market is fundamentally, you know, consolidated in a way that hasn't happened before, which I would argue probably the opposite has happened, you know, the last, you know, 18 months, uh, barriers to entry even lower now, where I think a part of the digitization of, of the market it actually made it easier for carriers to come in. You know, mm -hmm. where before there were still super low barriers to entry, but you still had to get to know a broker uh, or to no load board. By definition, yeah. you're in the spot market because you're small, just because you, you don't have the fleet scale to support contract positions. So I think part of what drove the overshoot this time around was you know, there's never been more technology. There's never been easier for, for a small operator to get access to the market, which you can't argue against that. Like that's fantastic. That's it. That's level in the playing field. I think that trend continues, but I think that's part of what drives, I think the level of the overshoot last time around. And I think also has driven to the level of the correction that had to happen. Um, you know, because of that this time around. I'm going to fire off three quick questions from the audience here. Any thoughts on the classification of independent contractors law going live here soon? Impact to the market? I That in my wheelhouse, we report on it. Uh, yep. But uh, our Washington correspondents are better at answering that than I am. Yep. Likewise, how about a, someone asked, do you think AB5 in California will be detrimental to the industry? I think the industry's taken pretty clear stands. They don't think it's favorable. Trucking needs to partner with other um, industries where there's a lot of independent contractors, software design, uh, engineering, and maybe get their message across better to politicians. Has anyone heard of steel pricing going up later in the year? Uh, a major customer of this person said they plan to expect steel prices. I Again, I don't know if that's exactly in our wheelhouse. I'm not surprised to hear it, but any other thoughts there? Tim, you may be the yeah. closest I mean, to that. 
<laughs> I haven't. I mean, steel prices have been steady, pretty steady for a while now. I haven't heard anything specific. I mean, they've been heading upward. Um, I think there's maybe some concern around that big merger that's going on, but that seems like it's got a pretty big hill to climb still. So I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I, I want to go back to your AB5 question. I think this yeah. goes back to the independent contractor thing. The market's going to find a price. Like yeah. at the end of the day, the government is going to continue to interfere. And, and, and we are seeing a, a process of more and more regulation around labor. Uh, I think it's inevitable at some point that we see uh, other states follow suit with what uh, uh, California did. Uh, the federal government, uh, who has a very populist and progressive sort of stance right now, uh, I think will attempt to outlaw independent contractors as much as they can. But I think at the end of the day, the government, the, the, the market will find a way. I mean, look, if I'm a carrier, and I, and I know that this is like blasphemy to tell carriers this, I want as much regulation as I can put that I can afford to deal with because I want everybody else out of my industry. Um, I know that's blasphemous and everyone's complaining that I just said that, but that is what you want if you want restriction of supply is you want to make it difficult for everyone else. Regulatory capture. Yeah, well, that's not wrong, but here's, here's here, here, let me add something on the regulatory side. I, I totally agree, Craig, but uh, I think one reason to stay a little bit more cautious on the freight market this year is one big set of regulations that the fleets are dealing with right now on the equipment side is these big low NOx regulations in 2027. There's also going to be a yeah. GT3 regulation. These are going to push the cost of a new class eight truck up considerably and there's likely to be a pre-buy ahead of that which is not going to be good for the cycle but afterwards the barrier entry will go up yeah <laughs> yeah so that was actually going to be one of my uh last few questions here we're down to the last five minutes um you have you and act in general um have talked about um this 2027 changes with the equipment, going to have a pre-buy. So what we could be looking at is we finally get back to health second half of this year. Let's call it equilibrium. And then we have a real barn burner in 25 potentially. And then we start pre-buying trucks again in 26 to avoid the 27 mandate. We're just going to kill ourselves all over again, aren't we? That's right. Um, now, some of the, uh, the, I mean, I that's exactly right. <laughs> Some of the, the rules that, that are taking effect later in the decade could actually restrict truck production. They're still working on the GHG three rules, so that's uh, there's there's still a lot of game to be played there. Uh, but those could actually restrict truck production to the extent that it would uh, push rates up considerably. But we're talking like early twenty thirties. Okay, we've got a question here. I think it's really um, appropriate. What if the industry? stagnates in March and April. We don't get a spring pickup. Um, will we see a lot more carriers? I'm going to paraphrase them. They're saying bankruptcy. What we see at Reliance a lot is ceasing of operations. They don't have enough bandwidth to file bankruptcy. Will we? I think the answer is yeah. kind of obvious. Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 there's a lot of data on this that a majority of the miles that carriers that are operating in the spot market are at a loss. And, you know, one of the things, and this sort of packs up what Chris said, is the brokers have created a cash flow. They've actually elongated the, the, the cycle longer than otherwise. Because remember, in the old re freight recessions we had back in, you know, prior to when brokerage took a large sort of percent of the freight market, is not only would you lose your rate power, but you would also lose the volume. It would stay with the bigger carriers. Brokers have changed that whole dynamic, and they've allowed smaller carriers to, to at least generate some cash flow to keep their businesses alive. But over time, that adds up. And I think we'll see uh, if things continue to stagnate in April, uh, March, April, and May, I think you'll definitely see more uh, carriers leave the market. Right. I was having a conversation with a large shipper last week, and I asked her, I said, when's the last time you used the phrase core carrier, which was a phrase from the late 80s, probably into about 2005 or 10. You've really heard it hardly at all in the last 15 years. And she laughed and she said that's because with the growth of brokers, that's given shippers access to capacity that they didn't have before. And so it was an interesting uh, comment there. Um, last uh, couple minutes here. So, Craig, if we had to pin you down on the month where it starts to favor motor carriers, what is your best guess? I, I was, I'll take two months. Can I have two months, Tom? Yes. Uh, we'll have a good June. 
We'll have a really strong, robust June, and I think we'll uh, we'll have a strong uh, se late second half of October will be will be relatively strong, and then everybody will have forgotten about the fact that we're in a freight recession, and we'll always be super bullish. Okay, Chris. I like it to go at least one month earlier than Craig. <laughs> September. <laughs> I was going to say that, but I, I, I yeah. No, I mean, I think. I think we could very easily see rates go year-over-year inflationary again early, early second quarter. I think when you start, enough of the market feels that we're we're talking about it. I think it's probably that kind of yeah, end of May, June timeframe. Tim, how about you? I mean, I think I think road check is always a very good litmus test. Mid-May, yeah. 14th, 16th this year, we see that capacity pinch. You know, it's not it's not we'll obviously see rates go up at that point, but it's it's that trajectory thereafter that's that's really going to be key. Uh, and I think, you know, the market will be back to balance. I'm, I don't, I'm not a, you know, quite as bullish on the trajectory, but, uh, but I do think they'll, they'll turn things up. We've actually got a couple of um, uh, questions that came in, in here as we were chatting the last moment or two, and they're, they're good ones here. I think we've kind of touched on them, but once the market shows signs of change, do you think brokers or ask, asset carriers will be in a better position? Well, it all depends on the mix of a freight broker I mean, ultimately, to get into a better environment should create winners across the board. But the transition can sometimes, depends on when your contracts renew for a freight broker, it depends on the mix of spot versus contract. I think a lot of things that we kind of know there. And then um, let's see here, from a trucking company perspective in 24, buy more tractors, sell dormant tractors, or hang on to what you have for now. Anybody have any advice on that? <laughs> It partly depends on the age and the maintenance cost, but <laughs> so I need more info to answer that question. <laughs> well, it depends on who their customer base is, what oh, part sure. of the country they're operating in. I mean, if they're in the NAFTA corridor or USMCA corridor, sure. there's a lot of variables in that. I mean, you should always be prepared to trim in the event that, um, you know, you don't have enough freight. You can not, you may not have enough freight even in a bull market <laughs> if you just lost a major contract. So, so I mean, that's what drive the cycle to begin with, right? Which you know, boy, you know, by the end of, of twenty, you know, four into twenty five, again, it's you know surplus operating profits. There's limited you know deployment options for those profits, and and you're going to reinvest the fleet because that's an absolutely laudable decision that you're going to make. And then again, now your old trucks go out of the secondary market, and we get to do all this again, you know, starting in you know, two thousand twenty seven. I'm going to take a little liberty as we wrap it up here, and provide a cliff note summary for those as we get ready to exit. So I think in general, I heard a couple of things, um, a fair amount of optimism on the second half of the year, ranging from modestly optimistic Tim to wildly optimistic Chris. Based on <laughs> past Craig. history and data. <laughs> exactly. Potential for spot rates to go up 30% from their low earlier this year by late this year. Maybe you meant year over year, but 30%. Yeah, yeah big number. And I think kind of to paraphrase something you talked about, Craig, on the OTRI, it's not so much the absolute levels as when change occurs. So we had a terrible, nasty downward direction. The fact that we're starting to point up, that's probably more important than the fact that the OTRI is a little over 4%. Maybe it's at 8% in a few months. It's the change in direction for better or worse. Yep. Guys, thank you very much. We may have to do this again sometime in the future. Um, really appreciate everyone's time and insights, as well as those from the audience. Take care, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.